John, it's a huge pleasure to be sitting virtually in the same room as you again. It's, what is such a busy time for you? What have you been doing over the past couple of weeks? Oh, nothing much. Um, <laughs> but it, it is true that December is a time of carol services and concerts. And I'll be very sad if the day ever dawns when I'm not involved in at least some of those as a guest conductor. Um, last year was, um, well, let's be honest, a sad year for people who love choral music at Christmas time. Um, we had to make do with virtual events, some of which were very beautifully done. Um, Britain's cathedral and collegiate choirs rose to the challenge. And so that was great, but a bit of a stopgap let's say nothing quite beats being there in the flesh. And so this year I've been back. Um, so far only one cancellation for a, a carol service in Oxford, which I was sad about, I must admit, but um, everything else has taken place, including two Albert Hall concerts with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and the Bach Choir last Thursday. And that was just a wonderful feeling, hearing 5,000 people belting their lungs out with Come All Ye Faithful and Heart the Herald and all of those. And so Christmas is kind of mm, two thirds back to normal. And let's just look forward as Benjamin Britten said, here we bring new water and the well's so clear to welcome the new year. And so um, we're looking forward to 2022 and 2021 has been better for Christmas music making than 2020 so far. I guess for so many of us, Christmas carols are actually how we first encountered choral music and choral worship. What was your first encounter with Christmas carols? Well, I suppose it was at nursery school, um, because in those days it was the law that um, every school day had to begin with an act of Christian worship. And so there I was in the front row, a little four year old, uh, while Miss Catherine thumped away at the piano and at Christmas time, I'm sure we sang away in a manger and all that the rest of the year, we had all things bright and beautiful and uh, when a knight won his spurs in the stories of old and all of those. And I remember I loved it and wished the whole day would be like that. Um, my mum kept my early school reports, and I think it must have been one of my very first when I was just four. And, uh, you know, reading, John is doing well, and arithmetic, John has a good sense of number and all that was all fine. Then it got to singing, and it said, John sings well if he sings softly. <laughs> and so I, I was potentially crushed at a very early stage, but it didn't actually deter me. I loved singing. I was useless at sport. And I think one of the nice things about singing in a choir was that I could still contribute to a team effort, um, even though it was not on the football field. And um, my parents had a visitor who came to our apartment in London and um, heard me sing and uh, doodling away at the out of tune upright as I did from when I was five or six, I suppose. And they said, well, he's got a nice voice. He ought to audition for St. Paul's Cathedral Choir. And my parents were not musicians and they never took it up. And I think I didn't want to do it because I knew that you had to board and that I would be away from my mum and dad. Um, I was an only child and I certainly didn't mind being on my own because I entertained myself for hours singing and playing the piano. But um, I think I wouldn't have liked to be away from them at Christmas time. And to this day, I feel a little pang of pity for the choristers in King's College Choir um, who don't see their mums and dads, at least not for all of the Christmas festivities. But um, from then, I was sent to a very musical school. And when I was eight, I went to Highgate School in North London, which had both, it was a boys' school, and it had a junior and a senior bit. And because I haven't actually got a piano in the room here, um, I pre-recorded a little bit just to tell you something about my musical experiences there. Highgate School in the early 1960s was actually quite a hotbed of carol activity, spearheaded by our amazing director of music, Edward Chapman. Now, he had been a composition pupil of Charles Wood, that great Cambridge caroler, more of him later, back in the early 1920s. 
And inspired by him, perhaps, he went on to write some rather lovely Christmas carols of his own, some of which we sang in the school chapel choir. I remember this one particularly, and sadly it was never published. It was a setting of Away in a Manger, and perhaps it was turned down because the publishers thought it would never supplant the popular tune by William James Kirkpatrick. But I think it's rather lovely, and it went something like this. I actually think Gustav Holst would have been rather proud to have written that. Then, of course, there was my great school chum, John Tavner, later to become world-renowned as a composer, mainly of sacred music, but he thought he would have a go at writing a Christmas carol. I think it was for a competition, and he would have been about 16 at the time. Well, if he did enter it, it didn't win and you can perhaps see why um, he didn't pick a terrifically good text. It's by John Mason Neal, that great Victorian hymn writer, but this wasn't perhaps his best effort. It goes like this. Earthly friends will change and falter, earthly hearts will vary, he is born that cannot alter of the Virgin Mary. Born today, raise the lay, born today, twine the bay. Well, there you are. Anyhow, this is what John made of it. like a Christmas carol but it doesn't really sound much like the John Tavener we know. Of course one of John's most frequently performed pieces isn't really a Christmas carol but it does get done at Christmas, Little Lamb. Which somehow inhabits a very different world. Well, perhaps spurred on by John Tavener, I thought I'd have a go at writing a Christmas carol. Uh, I must have been, I was a year younger than John, perhaps I was 16 um, at the time, and I know that I entered it for a competition, and I'll say more about that later, but it was called The Nativity Carol, and it goes like this. That's another story. Well, there, there you are, Anna. Um, that's an expose of, of my introduction to carols. So you can see that as well as singing them in my school chapel choir, um, I found it just a short step to having a go at carols of my own. There was quite a carolly atmosphere at Highgate. And as to the competition, well, I only suspect that John may have put it in for the annual Bach Choir Composer Carol competition, which was adjudicated by none other than the great David Wilcox, um, director of the Bach Choir and of King's College Choir in Cambridge. And uh, I entered the Nativity Carol for it. And 
well, it not only didn't win, but it didn't even get a highly commended. And I mean, it probably didn't help that the tune goes up to a top F sharp and it's supposed to be something a, a, an audience could join in. Um, uh, so, I, well, I like to think that's why. But what did happen was that it got published and it was among my very first published pieces um, taken on by Oxford University Press. And I say this shouldn't, but commercially it did actually do rather well, just a little four page thing. Well, now you've got to fast forward about seven or eight years to when I was co-editor of Carol's for Choirs 2. Um, I'd been invited to join David Wilcox as one of a team of two. And uh, every Friday night after he'd done the university chorus rehearsal, we'd gather around his kitchen table, him and me, with a pile of submissions, pieces that um, had either been put in by their publishers or by the composers or which one or other of us had heard and thought that we might mull over because with any anthology you have to decide not only what to put in but what to leave out and somewhat to my embarrassment we got to the nativity carol um, which had been in print for a while and David Wilcox said oh John yes we, are. we must have that in the book and I thought, well, shall I tell him? And I, I plucked up my courage and said, well, David, uh, you do realise that you judged that in a carol competition uh, some seven years ago and it didn't win. So you obviously didn't like it very much. And he picked it up and looked at it again. He knew perfectly well that it had done well in print. And he said, yes, well... I think it's improved remarkably since then, John. <laughs> and so it did go into the book. Um, but uh, there we are. Um, I, I, I already had, in a way, had a little start into the world of carols. And then I suppose it was natural that I wanted to study music at Cambridge University because it's been um, a city of carols for a very long time. I was drawn, I suppose, primarily by the sound of King's College Choir and St. John's College Choir, who were also making remarkable recordings that were making waves around the whole choral world and beyond, really. And yes, I didn't want to be at King's. Um, I thought I might get swamped in such an illustrious musical college. Um, so I thought I'd go next door instead. And um, Clare College, King's is next door, neighbour along the River Cam was kind enough to have me and I was supposed to be reading modern languages because my headmaster um, never thought much of me as a musician and it's, it's a bit difficult a lot of good musicians at my school including John Tavener who was not only a wonderful composer um, but a fantastic pianist rattling off concertos when he was 12 and so on and let's say a flamboyant organist as well um, his improvisations would have been something rather special after even song but um, well uh, anyway I went to Clare and of course I was able to eavesdrop on Kings anytime I liked and indeed um, the other college choirs though it was a very different world then because of course it was mostly all single sex colleges and there weren't the mixed chapel choirs which became one of the great glories of the Cambridge musical scene but that was in the future um, the first three colleges to become mixed were um, Clare, King's and Churchill in 1972. Well, Churchill never had a chapel. Um, it was a new college and they, they didn't. Um, King's choir was always going to continue pretty much as it was um, until the crack of doom. And it was Clare that was greatly transformed because we were the first college to give choral awards to women um, on an equal basis to the, the guys. And that was somewhat my nagging the senior tutor, but it actually worked. And so we had a lovely mixed choir to work with. However, it's worth saying that um, on this whole theme of carols, that Cambridge has had a very long tradition of carol collections um, in print. Um, people sometimes think that Wilcox and Rutter were the first two Cambridge carolers. Well, we weren't. And I've got a beautiful example for you, um, which we'll just show you up on screen now, if we may, Ben. Well, there it is. It's not in great condition, but then it dates from 1420. Um, it's 
a, a roll of 15 carols, not all Christmas carols, um, uh, and it's got actually on the same roll the Agincourt song as used by William Walton in Henry V. But you can perhaps just see if you look at the top stave of music that it's um, there is no rose of such virtue. There is no rose of such virtue as is the rose that bears you. It's there in that top stave. The words are a bit indistinct. They're um, sort of below where the music is. And uh, I was privileged to be shown and uh, I was allowed to handle that amazing role. Uh, a piece of absolute musical history and the influence it must have had because of course just that very carol there is no rose has gone around the world um, so there were Cambridge carol collections um, going right back to 1420 and I've got one for you we're going to take a big jump forward in history now to the early 20th century here's the next one I'd like to show you It dates from 1924, and um, it's called the Cambridge Carol Book. There we are. Um, Charles Wood and George W. Woodward. And if you've ever sung um, Ding Dong Merrily on High, it's probably in Charles Wood's harmonization, which is first published in that book. Um, uh, th those two, Wood and Woodward, were kind of the Rodgers and Hammerstein of, of the carol world, really, because what they did was um, gather together from old collections, many different sources, um, good tunes. Uh, sometimes they had good words and sometimes they didn't. And when they didn't, G. W. Woodward, the Reverend, um, they were both fellows of Gondolin and Keyes College. Um, would, 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 uh, he'd fabricate texts of his own. And if you actually think about those words that he wrote, I mean, ding dong merrily on high, um, you know, let, let steeple bells be swung and e'en so here below, below. Um, when did you ever hear anybody saying that as they wheeled their wire basket around the supermarket? I mean, the, the language was very archaic even then, but it sings beautifully, wouldn't you say, um, Anna? I mean, all those wood, wood, wood carols um, hold their place in the repertoire. And um, uh, uh, they, uh, they did four collections. There's the Cowley Carol Book, Songs of Zion, um, uh, da, 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 that Cambridge Carol Book, and one, uh, the Italian Carol Book, which is the least known of them, but it's actually a, a really nice one. Now, what was remarkable about what they did was that they drew their tunes from so many different sources. Let's just find now the one where Ding Dong Merrily on High comes from. Okay, that's a publication of 1588, um, put together by um, a Frenchman whose pen name was Toineau Arbo, and it's, it's a dance manual, um, the Orchestographie, and um, you read dance um, charts downwards, so if you look at the top of the page, you'll see the instructions for what steps to take, um, uh, as you go down the page, and in order to make the music fit, um, he writes the music down the left-hand side sideways. And uh, so just for convenience, at the bottom of the page, I've actually put the melody there. And you can pretty much read it as if it's in B-flat, which is the, the key that we know it in. Ding dong merrily on high, in heaven the bells are ringing. And there's a repeat mark there, so you sing that twice. And then comes the famous Gloria, where you have to see if you can last all the way to the end. Um, it was certainly never intended for sacred use, but it's a rattling good tune. And um, G.R. Woodward uh, cobbled together his text to fit it. And uh, so that was one source of that dance book. Um, Peter Warlock did five other tunes from the book as part of his Capriol suite with no texts involved. But it's just interesting that um, from quite a long time ago, Christmas carols have been pulled in from all kinds of different sources. Here's another very influential collection from the 16th century.
Now, I expect you recognise that tune. Person and hodie, voces puerule, laurantes yucunde, quinobises nacus. That was put together by a Finnish schoolmaster in 1582, and it's a collection of all sorts of different songs, really, for, that he probably gathered in from here and there, called Pie Cantiones. And from that remarkable book, we've not just got um, Pesson and Hodier, um, we've got Of the Father's Heart Begotten, um, we have got um, Unto Us is Born a Son, um, and th there are several others that have become absolute standards. And uh, so uh, uh, that collection, which was very little known, um, came into the possession of uh, Wood and Woodward, and they put those tunes to use. And it, it's probably true to say that um, a lot of our repertoire today um, owes the fact that it's there and in our memories and in our hearts to Wood and Woodward who so indefatigably gathered the music in from those old collections. We owe them a great debt. Do you think that perhaps part of the appeal of our modern day carol services is the fact that we can draw a line back from today all the way back to the 1500s and beyond? And yes. whatever changes are going on in the modern world, whatever advances are happening, there is some consistency every year. We know the same music will come around at the same time of year in every chapel and church across the country. Oh, yes. I mean, Christmas is a time when, in a changing world, we certainly look to the familiar. At the same time, of course, I mean, new carols continue to be added to the repertoire every year, and that's, that's great. Um, and, and of course, they didn't all collect um, carols in from old books. Um, Vaughan Williams took a rather different approach because he loved to go out and get his boots muddy and collect tunes, folk songs, from the lips of the horny-handed sons and daughters of toil in whatever villages. A lot of them were conveniently situated in Surrey and Sussex, not too far from where he um, lived. And the thing is, he figured pragmatically, as did Wood and Woodward, well, what does it matter what the original words were all about? Um, if it's a good tune, then it will um, fix itself in people's hearts. And this is um, one that I'm, I, it always, always amuses me rather particularly. You probably know it um, as Forest Green, uh, because that's the name of the village where he collected it. And uh, it's sung to the words, O Little Town of Bethlehem. But um, the original words um, actually go like this. <clears throat> I'll put on my archer's rustic voice for this, I think. <laughs> I am a ploughboy stout and strong as ever drove a team. And three years hence asleep in bed, I had a dreadful dream. And as the dream has done me good, I've got it put in rhyme that other boys might read and sing my dream when they have time. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I don't think that would go down too well in the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols, but um, Vaughan Williams saw something in the tune and it fitted, of course, beautifully to Bishop Philip, Philip Brooks's words um, of O Little Town Bethlehem. Um, but uh, there you are. I think that's, that's just an illustration of um, how we've gathered carols in. Um, we think they've always been there and some of them have indeed, as you say, been there for centuries. Um, but it, it's worth remembering that, for example, um, you think of the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols in King's College as the essence of what Christmas is all about um, for anybody who loves music and who loves the words of the Bible and so on. But it only dates back to 1918 in its present form. And um, so it's just over 100 years old. Um, and um, I haven't got for you, unfortunately, because I've lost it, but I did have an order of service booklet for not the first one, but the second one in 1919. And it's striking, actually, how similar it is to the pattern of the service today. The only thing that's different is that they finished with a Magnificat 
then the Canticle of the Virgin Mary, because of course it is the chapel of Our Lady in King's College. And that, that would be rather nice to revive actually, wouldn't it? Um, but as far as I know, that, that um, has gone. However, the pattern of that service went all around the world and was reflected, I suppose, really in the um, Carols for Choirs series that um, I knew about uh, long before I was actually involved in editing it. And this is a story that goes right back to the year that the Green Book, Carol's for Choirs One was published at 1961, at which point I was an occasional callow adolescent bass in the back row of my school chum, John Taverner's church choir in West London. And I remember it must've been a choir practice early that December when he came in clutching a green book and said, just listen to this. And he went to the organ and he played the Wilcox Descant to O Comely Faithful. He'd only had one copy. So we all clustered around the organ and the sopranos all sang it. And we gasped, um, you know, it lit up the sky. And uh, that was the first year that book appeared. And I've actually got a first edition of it, which um, Ben's going to show us now. There we are, there's my, um, my uh, pre-owned copy. And you can see how dated the font has become. When it came to Carols for Choirs 2, which was um, in 1969, they put that together, came out in 1970. Um, the font has uh, got modernized, the angels remained the same. And I'm very sorry to confess to you, and you can see my guilt written over the front there, it's Clare College Chapel Library, unfortunately. Um, I have never returned it to them. Um, so um, I, I hope they don't come after me for that. But, um, we have exactly the same ones at Pembroke in the Pembroke Library. We still have the first editions there as well. Oh, wonderful. Well, um, the, th the thing was that Vol 1 was, of course, a runaway success. And uh, it, the time came for a Vol 2. Uh, Reginald Jakes, who was David Wilcox's co-editor, was inspector of, of schools music for London and also the conductor of the Bach Choir. And uh, it was felt by Oxford University Press that they would make good collaborators because David Wilcox was already making waves with um, what you might call the more churchy um, side of the repertoire because of the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols. Reginald Jakes was more choral societies and the sort of things that you might do in, in a concert. Um, but he died not very long after the first book came out. And so um, David Wilcox, when he was asked by Oxford University Press, look, we need a second volume. He said, okay, I'll do it, but I know that I won't have time to do it on my own and I'd like a collaborator, by which time um, he um, knew about my work um, writing Christmas carols, among other things. Um, he was sort of a, how shall I put this, talent scout, a spy um, for OUP. And at the end of the Harmony and Counterpoint class that I was a member of one week, he came up to me and said, oh, well, Mr. Rutting, I understand you've been composing. And I said, oh, yes, well, I have, Mr. Wilcox, I have. He said, Would you bring me a selection of your works to, to my rooms in King's at nine o'clock on Monday morning? And of course, he was a war hero and had been a military commander. So when he said something like that, it was an order, not a suggestion. And I, I turned up with um, a, a little um, clutch of carols in my bag that Monday morning, among which was a piece called The Shepherd's Pipe Carol. Um, and uh, he looked up and said, oh, yes, well, would you be interested in that being published? And so uh, that actually predated the um, Carols for Choirs 2 book by a year, a year or two, something like that. But um, he asked me, would I like to co-edit it with him? So, um, gosh, I was very honoured. Um, because you can probably imagine that when I first sang those descants from book one as a schoolboy, I never imagined that one day I would be a co-editor of the series with him. And it was a wonderful collaboration, really, um, because he had the experience and the wisdom and he was encouraging towards me. He did say, I must admit, with the shepherd's pipe carries, I can't 
quite see it in Kings. And of course, he was absolutely right. But he did premiere it with the Bach Choir um, in the Royal Albert Hall. So, gosh, I can't complain about that. Um, I don't know why. Um, it must have, I think it was probably, why did I start writing carols? Really don't know. Um, it, except once, it, I, I think my environment had a lot to do with it at school, as I've suggested. Um, but um, I, I possibly it's because music critics take a holiday in December. And so I, I thought, well, I'm not going to get nasty things said about me because they don't bother to review um, Christmas carols, which um, is, is certainly... True, and I was slightly swimming against the tide because I love avant-garde music. Um, I love to know what's happening at the cutting edge. Um, but as a, a composer, uh, if I've got any sort of a gift, it's not for writing that kind of thing. Um, and I, I always thought, well, you know, there's, it's not a sin to write a tune or occasionally have a key signature. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 I suppose I'm 50% songwriter, really, 50% composer. And the Christmas Carol was quite a nice repository of um, what, whatever melodic uh, material I might have got um, inside my head. Yes, go on. Are you ever tempted to uh, sort of write under a pseudonym for a while and just uh, release some completely different things because I imagine there must be a huge weight of expectation people know your music and they know what they expect it to sound like I know what to expect my wife's always saying that she says oh go on surprise them um, do something really shocking I was tempted to take on a pseudonym of an unknown um, Latvian composer um, because uh, com uh, this must have been about 15 years ago, Baltic states became terribly fashionable in, in choral circles, um, you know, and I thought, well, I could pretend to be a 25-year-old Latvian composer called sort of Erki Nerki or something like that, and nobody would know. Um, but otherwise, I must have, I've only written under a pseudonym once, uh, well, no, twice. It's when I always thought Henry Purcell should have written a set of responses um, for use in, in Anglican worship. And he actually never did. So I thought, well, I'll supply them. Um, and uh, for all I know, the manuscript um, may be in Clare Chapel Library to this day. The other time was when I thought um, I'd write Stanford in E. Um, because there are only four sets of Stanford Magnificats and Nunc Dimittises, and I thought, well, uh, the, my choir, like yours too, probably loves to sing them, and uh, I'll augment the supply discreetly with uh, an extra set, which I claimed was in a long-lost manuscript in the Clare Library, um, and nobody was going to dispute. I got away with it for quite some time, but it's I finally... It's anywhere. I would, what is it? I would love to see it. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I can show it to you sometime. Um, what we genuinely have, actually, here's another um, Cambridge Carol link. Um, Cecil Sharp's manuscripts are all in the Clare Library, including, no doubt, the Holly and the Ivy. Now, where would we be without that Carol at Christmas time? And um, he bequeathed all his manuscripts of the stuff he collected out um, around all the different counties of England to his old college, which was my college. And so that will be in there somewhere. Um, but um, what you won't find is the illusory manuscript of, um, of Stanford and E. So I thought, well, I, I could embark on a life of forgery and crime, but oh, Anna, I, I, I thought I wouldn't um, somehow. <laughs> I um, just had a, a question from Judy White, uh, who has worked with you through the Stay at Home Choir. And she's asked you, what is your favourite Christmas carol and why? Um, what, just from history, from anywhere? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I've got two, I suppose. Um, they're both actually German for some, some reason. One, one's called Essie Stein Rosenspungen. Um, uh, we don't know who wrote it, but we do know that Michael Pretorius, um, early in the 17th century, did, um, well, lots of harmonizations of it, actually. Um, but uh, the, the one we usually sing, um, is his, and that kind of defines it. I mean, there have been recent um, tropes upon it, like the Sandstrom one, um, which turns it into, in effect, something else. 
but I think it's one of those tunes that combines tenderness and strength. And the text about the Virgin Mary, which of course translated into English was really the one that Herb Powell's used for a spotless rose, is also lovely. Those images of the Virgin Mary as a rose um, and Christ springing out of the, the, the stem of Jesse and all that, um, I find very evocative. Um, and so that's one of them. The other is in Dulce Jubilo, um, because it's a dance, um, it fits in perfect canon with itself, and uh, the legend has it that it was first sung by angels on Christmas night, 1482, to um, a German mystic, a monk called Heinrich Suso, and um, he um, is the source of the first manuscript of this much loved carol. And there's an astonishing footnote that says, this was sung to the author by the angels on Christmas night. Oh. I believe it. <laughs> it's lovely. Um, we've actually got another question as well that I I'll ask you at the same time. And this is about keys. This is a conversation I think we've had before about the key of G flat major. And Philip has asked what it is about G flat that draws you to it so often and what G flat brings that say G or F don't have. Oh, everything. It's, it's such a beautiful key um, that it, theoretically, I know, and you know, that in equal temperament, theoretically, there's no difference, but there is. Um, and uh, in terms of vocal ranges, um, there's in many soprano voices, there's a break around about E, a tenth above middle C, E natural. Um, it, it's not always a soprano's best note. And uh, if you sing a downward scale in G flat, starting up on G flat, you don't, you, you bypass that, uh, that wolf note as it were. And so it, it, it's a very vocal key. And the other thing is that if you're writing for strings, there are no open strings on any stringed instrument um, in, in that, um, that key. And so you can use vibrato on any of them equally. So it tends to be warm and expressive. And the, the famous G flat pieces in musical history, oh gosh, there's a Song of the Moon from Vorjax Rosalka, and there's Berlioz, is that beautiful love duet in Act Two, Nuit de Fresse. Um, they just wouldn't be the same um, if you transposed them. Um, and so, no, it's a key that um, it has got a beautiful warm glow to it. And um, I love it. And let's remember that it's so easy to play in because um, uh, uh, those black notes give you something to hang on to. Um, mm -hmm. One of the hardest keys um, to play well in is C major um, because it doesn't have any black notes. And uh, actually F sharp, G flat, um, call it whichever you like, um, was the only key in which the great songwriter Irving Berlin could play. Um, and so, <laughs> Also, you know, um, your What Sweet Music, which is one of my um, personal favourites from your uh, from your output. Could you tell us a bit about how that piece came about? Oh, What Sweet Music. Well, um, I suppose I first walked into King's College Chapel when I was having a little recon reconnaissance trip um, with my friend John Tavner. Um, we both thought we might come to Cambridge if they'd let us in. And... Um, he went to the Royal Academy of Music instead. I came to Cambridge, but um, I'm sure I attended an Eden song. And that gave me a first taste of that wonderful King's Chapel acoustic. And I think um, I, I remember thinking to myself, oh gosh, if I could just write something that would be heard in here. Um, and it finally came to pass in 1987 when um, the late Sir Stephen Cleabury um, I think it was still the era of telephone calls then. Um, he rang up and said, look, John, we've got a gap in this year's Nine Lessons and Carols. Um, just before the lesson about the three kings visiting with their gifts. And he said, we usually do the Peter Cornelius um, Three Kings, but I don't want to do that this year because I've got two equally good baritone soloists. And I give, if I give it to one of them, the other will be furious. And so I'd like to get out of that dilemma by not doing a piece at all. Would you write something? And um, I don't know why, but those words of Robert Herrick um, came into my head. What sweeter music can we bring than a carol? for to sing the birth of this our heavenly king. Um, I wasn't the first composer to set them. They were originally set to music by Henry Laws, 
back in the 17th century. Um, and it was called A Carol for New Year's Day. And sort of going up to epiphany, I suppose. And Richard Rodney Bennett, a composer I had very, very high regard for, also did a setting. But I thought, well, maybe there's room for another one. And I handed it over to um, Stephen uh, with full confidence that it would get a wonderful performance. And I actually wrote a little bit about this, Anna, in um, a book just called King's College Choir. And this is what I said. Um, Generally, I find composition easier when I know the performers and preferably the occasion that I'm writing for. On both counts, I was off to a good start when Stephen Cleabury telephoned me in 1987 with an invitation to write a carol for the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols. The sound of King's College Choir and the acoustic of its chapel have been part of my interior landscape ever since I was a Cambridge undergraduate in the 1960s. And after all these many years, I'm still moved and inspired by the Christmas Eve Festival, an event that seems to offer a ray of light and hope in a sometimes almost unbearably dark world. I said yes, and immediately started to search for a text, the essential first step in the, the vocal composition. I soon found what I was looking for in the works of Robert Herrick, whose simple delightful verses have an intrinsically musical quality, which has attracted many composers. Um, so there we are. Uh, writing the music to these words took several hard, concentrated days. As always, one plays endlessly with intervals, melodic shapes, rhythms, the raw materials of music until they feel right. That's to say the music should appear to have sprung out of the words with no effort or contrivance, almost as if no one had composed it. But that, in some sense, uh, the, you want it to feel like it's always been there. As Stephen Sondheim memorably put it, what's hard is simple, what's natural comes hard. But I do believe a carol should sound simple and natural, which may cost considerable effort on the part of the composer. For me, a composition is finished when the deadline has arrived and there's no more time left to polish it, or pick it to pieces or rewrite it. On the appointed day, I delivered a manuscript to the King's Porter's Lodge, secure in the expectation that on Christmas Eve, I would hear a performance as near perfection as any earthly musicians could achieve. I was not disappointed. So I'd forgotten I'd written that till I uh, found, found the book that I contributed it to. Oh. It's lovely. But there was actually a postscript to that. It got used in a television advert, um, which I certainly hadn't expected. Um, it was for Volvo, the, the, the Swedish car manufacturer. And um, in the era of faxes, I got a fax saying, you know, we have a client interested in using a piece of yours. And I said, well, hang on, are you sure you've got the right guy? And they said, oh, did you write a piece called What Sweet and Music? I said, oh, yeah. Said, well, that's the one they want, A, to sell motor cars. And I thought, well, this, you know, this is, after all, it's a religious carol. I mean, I'm not sure that this is an appropriate idea at all. Um, this was only the first screening in the States. It never actually went past North America. But um, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm really not sure about this. They said, well, uh, it's almost too late. Uh, we've shot the advert to the music. And so I said, well, you better send me a video, which I will look at. And so I, by courier, I, in a day or two, I did indeed get a video, plugged it in. Do you remember VHS videos? Oh, yeah. um, and um, it showed scenes of, of American life, very heartwarming. You know, there was a farmer um, with the sun behind him with his check shirt, you know, harvesting the, the wheat, um, you know, and all of that. And then there was a mother cradling a baby by a blazing log fire and so on. And there was no, um, no commentary at that point. They were just listening to the carol, admittedly with the words blurred, they put a high frequency cut on it so you can really tell what we were, we were singing about. It was my recording of it. And at, at the, the ad was called Survivors. And in the last five seconds, it was 60 second ad, they said, these people share a common belief. They owe their life to an automobile. Uh, the idea was that uh, they would have died if they'd been in any other car and, and the crashes they'd been in. And so um, Joanne looked at me and said, well, does it offend you? And I said, well, no. And um, I asked her, well, does it offend you? And she said, well, no, but I don't really understand why they want to use it. 
Um, but no, it doesn't offend me. She said, if I were you, I'd take the money. So <laughs> I, 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 I did. And um, uh, American friends of mine from that day on have said, oh, hey, hi, it's, the, it's John, the car salesman. <laughs> um, so um, th there it was. Uh, so Stephen Cleabury had a characteristically dry comment. He said, well, John, he said, um, Yes, um, uh, I think perhaps I should be entitled to a share of the royalties. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I must admit, I don't think he really meant it. Or, um, uh, there it was, but it was certainly something I could never have expected to, to happen. Um, but um, you touched briefly in, in the extract you were reading. Yeah the thing you wrote that about your sort of compositional process more broadly and I'd love to actually ask you about that I mean when you are writing a new piece do you sit at the piano with manuscript paper and a pen and pencil and, and rubber or or you want to not have any writing implements anywhere near you and just try things out at the keyboard first oh um no very definite pattern except I try to keep regular hours when I'm doing it you have to have some basis of discipline and I think any professional writer will tell you the same whether it's words or music I do doodle at the piano um but I'm a terrible pianist and so I I um, go to my composing cottage where no one can overhear and be troubled by it um sometimes I work at a desk sometimes ideas literally do come to me in the bath um, and I always keep on my side of the bed, I always keep some manuscript paper and a pencil. And I do sometimes chop things down far into the night. Uh, I've got some beautiful countryside near the cottage where I go to work. And um, I actually had the idea for one of my most recent ones on one of those afternoon walks. So um, it, it's very hard to generalise. And the question everybody get, asks composers, is, well, where do you get your ideas from? And I always say, well, St. Cecilia. Um, you know, I like to feel that um, she's the patron saint of musicians and she flies around sprinkling her fairy dust um, just wherever she wants to. And she's a very capricious lady. And it would be nice to say that she sprinkles it on only nice people. Um, but sadly, that's not true. Um, she sprinkles um, her ideas and her fairy dust um, on nice people and sometimes quite mean people. I mean, think of Wagner, you know, he wasn't a very nice person at all, but he wrote some sublimely lovely music. Benjamin Britten wasn't always a very nice person, but he actually wrote some all kinds of wonderful music, including carols. Interesting that in Britain, there's always been a soft spot for carols among many composers. Not everyone. I mean, Elgar didn't really have much interest in the Christmas carol, but, um, uh, you know, certainly Vaughan Williams and Hulse did in Benjamin Britten. Mm. And so um, there's quite a long tradition. And I, I sort of think of myself as just one tiny little tile in a great mosaic of, of carol writers. We've got another question here from Elizabeth, who said that some of your carols are very festive and some of them are more uh, thoughtful. What brings you into these different moods for different kinds of music? Oh, the words, um, really. It's as simple as that. I mean, if I've got a pre-existent text, I uh, copy it out, read it through, and, um, you know, then that will um, guide me to the kind of music I want to write. So, um, and when I write my own words, uh, again, people always say what comes first, the words or the music. I mean, it's, there are no rules about it. Christmas carols are such a funny ragbag. I mean, I actually got a little test for you, Anna. Here are two statements about a very famous, well, it's a Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald, and only one of them is true. Okay. Um, here's the first one. Um, the melody was written by Felix Mendelssohn to, uh, to celebrate the invention of printing. It was the 400th anniversary of, of Gutenberg, and it was a male voice cantata, and he insisted that it should never be set to any sacred text. So that's statement number one. Statement number two is that on one of Felix Mendelssohn's several visits to London, he was invited to the Methodist Chapel in City Road where um, he uh, was introduced to Charles Wesley. And um, he, he was sort of improvising away. Um, and 
to suddenly this tune, Charles Wesley showed him the text. It was originally Hark How All the Welkin Rings. And uh, Charles Wesley was so pleased with what Mendelssohn came up with that um, he said, yes, that's what will do it. And in fact, there's a commemorative plaque that you can see up on the chapel wall to this day. Uh, which of those statements is true and which is false? <laughs> I wonder if it might be a trick question, but I'm going to say that I think the second one is true. No, it's oh, wrong. Am I wrong? Oh. Charles, Charles Wesley died before Felix Mendelssohn was born. Oh. So they never met. And it was indeed, um, the original words uh, are uh, Gutenberg, du deutscher Mann. And I forget how it goes on. Um, and Mendelssohn indeed, did never want it to be set to any sacred words, but unfortunately, posterity disagrees and just try dislodging Hark the Herald Angels Sing now. And no, no one, no one really would, would want to do that, now would they? <laughs> now I, I think that you've got a little Brian K story up your sleeve. Is oh that well, this this is just to finish with because I know you have a very pressing engagement um, downstairs from where you are. The Albra Festival is about to be launched, right? It is. And you are part of that. Yeah. Um, you've got to sell next year's Albra Festival. Um, well, there, there we go. It's, it's always lovely. Do you like Snape and Albra? Oh, and... Beautiful. I mean, look at this wonderful building. Oh Maybe yes. For this Zoom meeting. Well, no, no, I just thought I'd finish with a, a little Christmas story about my very good friends, the King's Singers. Now, of course, I've known that the group has gone through many changes of membership, and I'm going right back to the original six members. And this is a story told by Brian Kay. Um, when um, it was around Christmas time, they were five out of the six were undergraduate members of, of King's College Choir. And um, in those days, King's was a single sex college. And if you were caught after hours with a young lady on the premises, you could be sent down. It was a very serious matter indeed. And it was important to be on good terms with the porters um, because they could, they knew everything that went on. And it was two o'clock one morning and one member of the King's Singers was seen escorting a young lady um, around the college grounds, perhaps to get her discreetly out by a back entrance. And Wilfred, the head porter, was doing his rounds with his flashlight. And so he shone it, and there was this lovely young lady. And um, he you know, shone the flashlight up and down, and he finally said, you can't wear skirts in here, sir. <laughs> and went on his way. And there was no retribution. That was the end of the matter. So there you go. And I have never managed to get out of Brian K, which one of the six it was, um, were actually involved in this shameful act. Can I just say, by the way, that um, some of these quaint and curious facts about Christmas carols, including the one about Mendelssohn and the, the cantata, come from a book I can warmly recommend, just simply called Christmas Carols by um, Andrew Gant, uh, who um, is, is the, the author of some very entertaining books, He's done one about church music. Anyway, um, there we go. Christmas carols from village green to church choir. And uh, that's where I got those little engravings from the Orchiosography and Pierre Cantiones. Um, so there we are. Um, what can remain but to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. And thank you for having me. Well, John, thank you so much. It's been lovely to uh, spend the, the hour sitting and chatting with you. And I hope that all of the rest of your concerts do go ahead as planned uh, over the next couple of weeks. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas too. And I would also just like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's bought a ticket for this event and is supporting the work of uh, Macmillan. Uh, do please go to their website if you do want to find out any more um, or receive any support. There are plenty of resources on there. Uh, but yes, as John says, nothing else left but to say have a lovely Christmas, have a very happy new year, and let's hope that uh, choral music can return with strength and vigour in January. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Great. <laughs>